Good evening, everyone. Hopefully people got to go outside and enjoy some sunshine after the snow yesterday. All right, so as things go, we, um, I'm Heather Boykman from uh, an AmeriCorps member with Chagrin River Watershed Partners. And as a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube page and also on our education page at probably tomorrow late afternoon. Um, we will be doing a Q&A question, question and answer at the end of the presentation. You can en enter questions anytime you want into the question area. And so no further ado, we are here with Katie Stubel. Stubel? You got I'm it. I did it, okay. Did it. Holden's Forest and Garden. And she's going to talk about the current and future forest. All right, Katie, you ready to take it away? Awesome. Yep. All right, so I'm Katie Stubel. I am the chair of the research department at Holden Forest and Gardens. And today I'm going to give a little bit of an overview about what research looks like at Holden Forest and Gardens and then some more specific details into some of the research that we're doing in our forests there. And so just to give you guys a quick overview, this is my home away from home. This is the Long Science Center at Holden Forest and Gardens. Um, if you've been to Holden, this is just around the corner from the Corning Visitor Center. That will be your landing pad as a visitor there. The Long Science Center houses the research department in its entirety, as well as our nursery operations. So these are the folks that are sort of growing up plants for the collections, for conservation efforts, as well as for research. And so Holden Forests and Gardens really is um, at its very core, a museum. And so by definition, a museum has collections of whatever, sort of pick your poison. So when we think about museums, we think about collections of stuff like art or fossils or maybe taxidermy birds. Um, but Holden Forest and Gardens has collections of living plants. So our collections are alive, uh, specializing particularly in woody plants, but also collections of herbaceous plants. We've got three campuses. Those campuses are um, Cleveland Botanical Garden. We've got the Holden Arboretum. And then the least well-known of our three campuses is the Leach Research Station. That's out in Madison. And it is our um, rhododendron breeding facility. And the other thing that's sort of unique is Holden Arboretum, the Holden Arboretum campus, um, is when we think of sort of spatial area, it's one of the largest arboreta in the country. Uh, and this is because in addition to our sort of collections areas and manicured gardens, we've got uh, several thousand acres of natural areas. And those natural areas are ranging from, you know, old fields, very young forests to old growth forests and wetlands and sort of everything in between. And so my path to being a research scientist at an arboretum was sort of a, a typical um, academic path. I, I was born and raised in the state of Maryland, and then I sort of moved all over the country. So after that, um, I moved south to the University of Georgia. This arrow doesn't point to the University of Georgia. Um, that's in northern Georgia, but I spent most of my time, approximately two years, living at the Jones Center in southern Georgia, where I studied longleaf pine savannas. From there, I moved a little bit north to Tennessee, where I did a PhD in deciduous forests, moved to the middle of the country for a postdoc, my first postdoc, where I studied mixed grass prairies, and then all the way to the West Coast, where I studied California grasslands. And this was the first time that I sort of did research with a very applied lens. So thinking about not only how our systems are functioning and how they look, but also thinking about um, best practices and restoration for ecosystems and how important that is. That was a postdoc. And then finally moving to the position I'm in now, which is at, of course, Holden Forest and Gardens in Northeastern Ohio. And as I mentioned, I chair the research department there now. I am also uh, a community ecologist. And so in the world of ecology, there are different subsets of things one might study. Community ecologists, study sort of assemblages of species. So we're thinking about multiple species, 
how they interact with each other in the environment to make the biotic system that we um, see and love. And, and I often think in this context about things that might perturb these systems. So thinking about challenges they face, primarily things like global climate change and non-native species, but also really using that applied restoration lens to think about best practices in, in managing and restoring these ecosystems. And um, just to introduce you very quickly to the team of folks I work with at Holden in the research department, this team is really designed to capitalize on our two main assets there. So we've got the folks that work in the collections, so those collections of living plants. Those folks are Juliana Medeiros here top left, she is an ecophysiologist. She studies sort of the function of plants. She often uses rhododendron as a study system, which is something we have a really extensive collection of at um, the Arboretum, also Leach Research and, and the, the Botanical Garden. Na in the middle, Nawi. She is an evolutionary ecologist. Na um, thinks about things at the sort of intersection of plant genomics, microbiome, and disease. On the right top is Connor Ryan. He is our rhododendron breeder and manages the Leach Research um, Center or station. And then bottom left, David Burke. He is the VP for Science and Conservation. And um, in his heart of hearts, he is a soil ecologist and thinks about interactions between soil microbes and plants in our natural areas and more and more also thinks about emerging pests and diseases on forest trees. And then myself, again, community ecologist and sort of somebody that thinks a lot about restoration and applied practice. And we, of course, supported by really incredible teams of folks at all sort of career stages. And so the, the team sort of ebbs and flows seasonally, so is big in the summer when we are in the middle of the field season, shrinks down a little bit in the winter. So this is the team for just my lab um, this past summer. And here we have people at all sorts of stages from my lead technician and from the postdoc in the lab um, to some high school students who, who do research with us all summer and some of them year round. And I think one of the really incredible things about doing science at a place like the Arboretum is uh, access to our natural areas. So I, I said we have really extensive natural areas. This is one of those natural areas. Um, and, and the benefits of this are, are several fold for me as a community ecologist and a restoration ecologist. We have really easy access to a really diverse set of forested systems. Um, and these are also forested systems that I know are protected into perpetuity by the Arboretum. And so I can sort of safely set up long-term experiments to understand the dynamics in these forests. And I'm gonna talk about some of that research here shortly. I think another really great thing about working at the Arboretum is, um, and it, this differs than what you see sometimes in academia, is, is we've got people, this is you know our um, PhD scientists at the Arboretum, and we have really different skill sets that we bring to the table, but we're all thinking about, you know, similar sets of plants and sort of the similar system. And so that really lends itself to all sorts of, of collaborative research. And just to highlight a little bit of this, and this is just a, a really brief subset um, of the sorts of stuff we do together. David Burke and I have been working on a project that looks at um, the ability of forests to sequester carbon and how that's impacted by acid rain. David Burke has been working with Juliana Medeiros on a project looking at the microbiome in rhododendron. Juliana is working with Na uh, to think about rhododendron genome and how that relates to um, function and resilience in rhododendron. And I have been working with Na on a project that scales biodiversity, looking from you know, biodiversity across species to biodiversity across genomes within species and how that influences ecosystem function. And that is just a small slice of that pie and how we collaborate. I think the other thing that makes us an interesting place to work is the collaborative power that we have across departments at the Arboretum. And so we have all these people sort of focused on the same mission, but again, coming at it with different 
um, tool sets. And so we, I think, really uniquely work at the sort of interface or nexus of what I think of as like doing, knowing, and teaching. And that is to say, we are, you know, doing conservation work. We are conserving and restoring our own forests. Um, we're knowing the outcome of that. So we're, we're not just doing it and not understanding the outcomes. We're, we're looking at how did that affect biodiversity? How did our actions affect productivity? How did our actions affect, you know, prevalence of disease in our forests? because we have a team of researchers that can go in and explicitly measure and quantify those things. And then we're teaching the public about the outcomes of this. And so, you know, we are limited in the scope of the work we can do in terms of conservation and restoration by the land we own and the land we touch. But we can have a much bigger impact than our force alone if we sort of share that information out with folks that also are managing and owning forests and sort of um, increase the amount of forests being protected and properly managed by, by sharing our knowledge. And so again, you know, thinking this is a woman doing some restoration work in a forest that we call um, working woods. Here's the team out in the forest measuring the outcomes of that. So looking at the productivity of these trees, teaching the public about, you know, what they could do in their own forests. And you know, all of this at the Arboretum is focused, as I said, on these forested areas. So why forests? Why is this a system that we are, are so heavily focused on? Forests are critical in Ohio. They constitute in, a, in an, a state that has very heavy agricultural land use. Forests are still about 38% of land cover in the state of Ohio. That's reflective of about um, the forested area in the United States as a whole. So forests are an important ecosystem here as well as nationally. And also, of course, um, providing some really critical services. So, of course, home to wildlife, preserving, conserving healthy soils, controlling movement of water across the landscape, and, and in doing so, really um, helping us maintain cleaner waterways. And then a really big and important one, forests are really important sinks for carbon. So when we think about climate change and sort of stemming the tide of climate change and specifically warming, uh, forests are storing lots of carbon, uh, both in the living biomass as well as in the soils. And so just to look for a, a brief minute at the importance of that, um, some research has gone into looking at uh, climate mitigation strategy, specifically natural climate mitigation strategy. So what are things we could be doing on the landscape that would help us sequester more carbon? What are the most important things we could do? And sort of looking here in the United States across um, habitat types, looking at forests, looking at agricultural systems and grasslands, looking at wetlands, turns out the number one thing we can be doing to stem the tide of climate change, and this is maybe not super surprising, is reforestation. So that's that top bar there. And so reforesting areas that were previously forested is our number one um, climate mitigation strategy of, of the natural climate mitigation strategies. The second most important one is actually natural forest management. So managing the forests that we do have. And so both of these things are things that we do a lot of at the Arboretum and that we also are really working on um, monitoring and understanding best practices for. And so this is one of our forests at Holden Forest and Gardens at the Arboretum campus. And we're really using these spaces to understand the threats that are faced by our forests right now, but also how we can sort of most effectively manage these forests. And so now I'm going to get sort of into the research side of things. I'm going to go through basically four pretty brief vignettes of how we are going about understanding the challenges that our forests face, looking for, um, you know, evidence and data that show us, you know, what the threats are to our forests, and also thinking about how we can go about managing these forests. And so we'll be looking at some of our research on phenology, thinking about how climate change will impact the timing of life history events, uh, thinking about non-native species, and, and it, Right now at the Arboretum, we have a brand new, sort of brand new, we'll get into it, um, 
non-native species and thinking about how the arrival of that species might shape our forests in the future. Looking at land use history, so these legacies of past human use on, you know, our forests and particularly on less obvious forms of biodiversity, something I'll call cryptic biodiversity, um, and how we can harness this understanding to improve restoration practices. And finally, we're going to look at forest management and a large scale manipulation where we're using Holden's forests as the living laboratories to really quantify uh, the impact of forest management on our forests. And so we're going to start with phenology and the timing of life history events. Um, this just to show that um, mean annual temperature in the United States has been going up decade on decade for the past century. This rate of change is expected to increase in coming years. And this is going to impact, you know, biotic life on Earth. And one of the first things that people noticed as a sort of signal or fingerprint, if you will, of, of this changing climate and specifically of warming has been a shift in the timing of, you know, when biotic things happen. So if we think about things that happen on annual cycles, is the timing of that changing? And so here we're looking at, you know, um, maple through time. And you, so you can imagine, you know, the cycle from when it first flowers to when it sets seed. And I think phenology is something that sort of people have a sense about. You might think, you know, you have roses in your front yard. When did those roses bloom 10 years ago? Are they blooming earlier now? When did they bloom last year? When are they blooming this year? So thinking about these sorts of things, and that's really measuring um, shifts in phenology. And in general, what we see is that phenology that happens in the spring, things like flowering, things like leaf out are happening earlier. But one of the things that's tricky about phenology is that the organisms that are shifting phenology are not sort of existing in a vacuum by themselves, but of course they have partners that they interact with in the, in the natural world. So, you know, partnerships are really varied, but also really critical. Um, things like interactions between diseases and their hosts, uh, plants and pollinators, uh, seed dispersers, and the plants that they disperse. Uh, even competitors. And what we get when we have interacting species is something that is sometimes called phenological mismatch. And, and this comes about because not all the species track the same signals to the same extent. So if everything tracked a warming temperature exactly, everything would just happen earlier, but to the same extent. So, you know, the whole suite of things that we see in the natural world might just happen a week earlier. But that's not how it works. So different things are queuing on different signals. For some things, that's temperature. For some things, that's light, um, you know, day length. Day length is not something that's going to change with climate change. That will be steady. Um, for some things, that's moisture, rainfall. And that's something that we ex expect will become more variable and more unpredictable in the future. Uh, the picture here is of monarch and its host milkweed. Uh, this is an interesting reason for a mismatch. So these monarch butterflies are overwintering in Mexico. So if they get a signal um, caused by temperature in Mexico to come north and then they get to Cleveland, but milkweed is not out yet, they would be here with no food to eat, right? No host plant. Um, and so they would do less well. And so this would be a phenological mismatch caused by the fact that they're queuing in on temperature, but in different parts of the world. So they're getting different signals. And so one of the things that we wanted to look at was a competitive re relationship in our forests between canopy trees, which are um, sort of out competing for light, spring ephemerals and the understory. And we, we cared about this both because uh, spring wildflowers in Ohio are some of our most charismatic wildflowers. They're, they're really beautiful species, um, but they're also sort of stuck with this really tenuous life history strategy. And that strategy is, these guys did this here, we're looking at one of our older forests at the Arboretum, um, and this carpet of um, primarily wild leek or ramps in the understory. 
And you can see that here they are getting light in the forest understory because they're out before the leaves are fully expanded, right? So spring ephemerals are, are ephemeral by nature because their life history strategy is such that they're gonna jump up out of the ground as soon as it gets warm enough. And then they're going to try to photosynthesize as much as they can before those leaves leaf out in the canopy, at which point the canopy trees will outcompete them for light, right? It's gonna become shady in the understory the light is going to be captured by those uh, overstory canopy trees and these guys are now going to be in the shade and then those leaves are too expensive and so they cement above ground and they're sort of done for the year and so they have this really short annual or they're not annuals but they have this short life history strategy where they've got to do all this action very quickly and so timing is really critical for them and so our question was are they going to advance enough that they will maintain that time in the light or will those canopy trees advance more quickly and they will have less time in the light in the understory. So here they are. This is a picture of our study plots. You can see here in the foreground a trillium with those red petals and um, there's a violet in the foreground and of course these wild leeks. I see some um, squirrel corn in the picture that is not yet blooming. And again, if you look at that canopy, these guys are doing all sorts of stuff before there are leaves on the ground. So we want to understand that timing. And so here's some of the beautiful spring ephemerals that we have at the Arboretum. We've got several species of trillium. We've got our trout lily, um, bloodroot in the bottom center. My favorite personally is um, Dutchman's breeches up in the upper right, looks like little upside down pants and um, squirrel corn in the bottom left. So here are some of the species that we're looking at, certainly not all of them. A sort of aside, but an interesting life history thing about these guys is all of those species are specifically dispersed by ants. So here's some ants dispersing a seed. You can see the round brown part of the seed, and then there's sort of this more gnarly bit along the top. That piece is called an elizum, and this is an adaptation specifically for dispersal by ants. And so this this is like I don't know, like buttercream frosting on the seed. It's sort of this fatty lipid rich bit on the seed. The other thing that is important about the elizome is that it contains a substance called oleic acid. Oleic acid um, is also emitted by dead ants. And so um, this is important because the ants live in colonies, right? And so they need to keep the colony clean. They have to remove dead ants. And so if you basically paint anything with oleic acid, an ant will pick it up. It's like compelled to pick it up. So they pick up these seeds and they disperse them um, back to their nest where they're, you know, they disperse them because they realize it's not a dead ant, it's in fact a tasty food piece. And the seed has then been moved to a nutrient rich site, which is the ant nest. And so this whole system is sort of in a race against time with this, the canopy that is closing in the spring. And so this is a community science led project that we run at the Arboretum. It's another great thing about the Arboretum the um, Botanical Garden as well. We have this really amazing group of volunteers who support the work that we do. And so when we do our phenology work in the spring, we are able to monitor these sort of the timing of the life, life history event three times a week. And in the science world, that's really outstanding. Usually people do it once a week, but for a phenomena that are supposed to change on the order of days, and so we've got a great group of volunteers that are able to get out there three times a week. And what they do is take photos in the plots of the canopy. So we use a hemispherical um, lens on a camera and we go to the same point, um, you know, multiple days through the year and then in multiple years. So we've been doing this since 2018. We've just moved into our sixth year of study. And so they go out and they take these photos. And so you can see, if you look at the structure of the trees, these are the same trees, this is the same plot. Um, looking at that on April 25th, second photo looking at that on May 9th, you can see no leaves, April 25th, May 9th, we've got a little bit of leaves popping on there. Um, May 13th, those leaves are expanding. So from the 9th, to the 13th, that's not many days, but that's when the leaves are starting to go. And then June 6th. 
And at that point, we are, you know, fully leafed out. And we can look at that, you know, in one year across time, but we can also say, look at a certain date through, through the years. And we can say, is the timing of that closure changing? So if we look at this, you know, upper, um, upper left, we're looking at 2018, we're looking at May 14th. So all of these photos are mid-May. In 2018, 2019, upper right, you can see maybe 2019 is a little more leafed out, but not much. 2020 looks way behind, so the leaves are not very expanded there. 2021, those leaves are way ahead, much more expanded. And so then we can match this with the temperature in those years. And so this is this is at its core a study where over very long periods of time, we'll be looking for a signal of climate change. Here, as I said, we're in our sixth year of data collection that just started two weeks ago. So right now we're looking at the first five years. This is not to say climate change is doing anything yet, right? Um, this is not long enough to look at the effects of climate change. What we can look at though, is year to year variability in temperature and how that drives these natural processes. Um, and of course, climate change is really a cumulative like changes in year to year temperature or climate um, and those trends over long periods of time. But over five years, we do have variability in what those temperatures look like. And so here we can see, we're looking at mean spring temperature. Specifically, we are looking at March and April when a lot of this action is happening or sort of getting triggered. And we can see here in the bottom left that 2018 was our coolest spring. 2019, 2020, we're getting warmer. 2021 was our warmest year so far. 2022, a little bit cooler, but not as cool as 2018, fell more in line with um, 2019, 2020. So that's the pattern of sort of spring temperature that we've been seeing. And so then we look at this in relation to the date of canopy closure. So what we do is we feed those hemispherical photos into a computer program and we say, hey, computer program, what percent sky do you see in here? And that goes from, you know, in the winter when we have no leaves on, it's about 65% sky. And we'll go all the way down to about 5% sky when the canopy is fully closed. And we say, what is the timing of that change? And so here we're looking at on the um, Y axis, the, the date at which that happened, sort of the day of the year. So January 1st being one, you know, and counting the days through the spring. And so when we did this for the first three years, there's actually not much different in the date of closure. So even though temperature changed, that wasn't being reflected in the closure of the canopy. That canopy wasn't changing when it was closing. <clears throat> Interestingly, when we got to 2021, it was like, boom, that's when we saw the change. 2021 was the warmest year. And that did close far earlier than the other years. 2022, we went back to sort of our standard. And so this was a little surprising. It seems to us from these um, five years of data that what, what we're seeing isn't a linear tracking of temperature by the canopy, but rather some sort of, um, I can't tell if it's a tipping point, it gets warm enough and then all of a sudden, boom, it goes earlier, or some really subtle nuance and the exact timing of the days that are warm. It could be that, and we'll need more, more years of data to tease that apart. But what we see is not just a linear tracking of those mean spring temperatures. The other thing we're doing while we're doing this is we're looking at the timing of emergence of the spring ephemerals. So what date did they come up? So here, looking at the emergence date of our four most common spring ephemerals in the plot, those being Dutchman's breaches, um, Trillium, squirrel corn, trout lily. And these guys do do much more linear tracking of temperature. And so this was nice to see. So our spring ephemerals do seem to be able to track the warmer weather. And so they are advancing their emergence in ways that seem to be relevant to a warming spring. And so we can see that 2018, again, our coolest year had the, um, the slowest emergence, so the highest date is the slowest emergence of our spring ephemerals, whereas 2021, which was our warmest year, 
had much faster emergence of those spring ephemerals and the other years sort of falling out in between. And so here we're thinking about how will climate change impact the timing of life history events. We see that both canopy leaf out and wildflower emergence are able to advance significantly with warmer springs, but might not track these more nuanced shifts in temperature evenly with spring ephemerals seemingly right now better able to track um, spring temperature more accurately and um, and a canopy leaf out being a little bit more unpredictable and, and maybe relying on warmer or more extreme changes in temperature. The next thing that we're going to look at is non-native species in our forests and so this is a sea of of course garlic mustard. I'm sure many of you guys encounter garlic mustard um, when you're out in the woods we have at the Arboretum a now core member, Mel, who I'm sure spends tons and tons of time with garlic mustard and also working on the project that I'm about to talk about. Garlic mustard is really a critical non-native species. So this is a non-native species native to Europe. Um, it's incredibly problematic in the region. Uh, it sort of can form dense stands within the forest understory and uh, has allelopathic chemicals, which can impact, you know, the ability of our native plants to grow. So this is sort of um, a threat to native biodiversity in our forests. And so Holden Forest and Gardens, but also many landholders in the region spend lots and lots of time, effort, energy in the removal of garlic mustard. The woman here on the right is Becca Troutman, she is the natural areas biologist at Holden Forest and Gardens, and she is very experienced with garlic mustard control and removal. And two summers ago, so summer of 2021, she was pulling garlic mustard and noticed that some of the garlic mustard appeared to be sick. So, so it didn't look healthy. And as somebody that has spent years controlling garlic mustard, this seemed unusual to her. Garlic mustard does not usually appear unhealthy. It's a really robust non-native species. Um, and this just didn't seem right. And, and so then she sort of started looking a little closer and she noticed that um, the, the plants that looked unwell had this sort of black stuff on their leaves and stems. And when she looked closer, she noticed that that black stuff was in fact lots and lots of aphids. And again, this is something that she had never seen before. So she collected some of the aphids and sent them off to an entomologist at the University of Illinois who um, was able to identify the aphids as the garlic mustard aphid. So this is an aphid species that is a garlic mustard specialist and is native to Europe, same as garlic mustard. So that makes sense, right? Garlic mustard native to Europe has a specialist aphid, the garlic mustard aphid also native to Europe. What was important and interesting here was this was the first time the garlic mustard aphid had ever been documented in North America. So garlic mustard really widespread in the region. Garlic mustard aphid, there were no recorded observations of it. And so that immediately sort of brought up the question as to, you know, what might this, what might these aphids do now if they're in North America? Um, and so here we can see a garlic mustard plant that is infected with the aphids. What you can see are these sort of thickened looking leaves um, that are kind of crinkled. We see these really twisted pods on them and the sort of darkening of the leaves. And so what they looked to us was like, these aphids were making these plants unhealthy. Um, and this seemed important, right? If we're gonna spend so much time working on the management of the species, it would be helpful if there was a sort of another force in the ecosystem that was sort of thwarting the plant as well. What we didn't know at the time though in 2021 was really, if this is the first documentation in North America, is it only at Holden Forest and Gardens, right? Has this just been newly introduced and there are like 10 of them here, you know, or is this more widespread? And so in 2020, 
well, what's this year? 2023. So in 2022, we sort of launched a, a community science effort to look at the distribution of the species. So we sort of rallied our volunteers at Holden Forest and Gardens, but then we sort of put out the word to land managers all across North America. Um, it got loaded into an app. So if you guys, if any of you guys want to track garlic mustard aphids, um, there's a, an app called EDMAPS, E-D-D-M-A-P-S, um, where folks track non-native species. And so we got them to add the garlic mustard aphid onto EDMAPS. We pushed it out sort of around the Northeastern US and beyond the, the Midwest Great Lakes region and said, hey, while you guys are out managing garlic mustard, could you look for the aphid and could you map it on this app for us if you see it? And so, you know, within a month, we had tons of hits, right? We saw it was all the way from Minnesota to Connecticut. So almost certainly it was not just introduced first at Holden Forest and Gardens. It was not just there, but it's in fact really widespread um, across the, the Northeast Great Lakes. And so this, is, this was good for us to know. The second thing we wanted to know is, as I said, we thought the plants looked unhealthy. Um, was that true? So were, was what we were seeing actually equating to something that we could measure in terms of sort of depressed um, fitness or growth in the plants? And so we rallied uh, our interns and conservation team. So the conservation team who was out pulling garlic mustard would bring plants in for us with and without aphids. So they find infected plants and non-infected plants and they bring it back to us at the Long Science Center. And um, the interns would process those plants. Specifically, they were looking at plant size, how big those plants were, and then reproductive output. So what were they doing in terms of seed production? And so just to give a little overview of just a subset of those sorts of data that we were collecting, we looked at total biomass. We, of course, looked at, you know, leaf size, um, all sorts of metrics on that. But here, looking at total plant biomass on the left, plants with the aphids, on the right, plants without the aphids. And we did see a significant difference in the size of the plants. Um, so, of course, lots of overlap, but plants without the aphids somewhat larger than plants with the aphids. So this is going in the right direction, right? It seems like the aphids are leading to at least smaller plants. And then what's really important when we're thinking about a really prolific non-native species, what we would want is for that species not to be reproducing in our ecosystems, right? So it's really critical to look at some sort of metrics of fitness. And so we did that by looking at seed weight and seed count. How many seeds were they producing? How big were those seeds? And again, um, here we're looking at aphid infected plants on the left, control plants on the right or the blue bars um, for seed weight on the left, sort of the left, or le the, the left graph and seed count, the right graph. And both of those depressed by aphids. So aphid infected seeds were making fewer seeds and those seeds were smaller seeds. And, and as you can see in the picture, the, the pods are twisted. Um, in general, they just look different. And so I think the question becomes, and this is still early days, right? This was just discovered two years ago. So we are still in this very basic fact-finding mode. Um, this seems like at least it's possible that this aphid might be having a detrimental effect on garlic mustard in the region and we have shown and found that the garlic mustard aphid is really widespread. So this could potentially, although it is really way too early to, to, to say this for sure, this has the potential to um, be detrimental to garlic mustard within the region. Um, the thing that we're gonna do this summer is get a handle on seed viability. So we know the seeds are smaller. What we need to know now, are they less likely to germinate? Um, and that's going to be a pretty big piece of the puzzle for us. So how might the arrival of a new species shape our forest? We have now the garlic mustard aphid in North America. 
Uh, we know now that it's widespread and it seems to be causing declines in the growth and seed production of garlic mustard. And so we really need to follow that thread a little bit more to see if those seeds are less viable and to see if we think it's possible that this might um, cause any sort of depression in the population of garlic mustard. The next thing that I'm going to look at, sort of shift gears here, is forest age and its influence on biodiversity. So what sort of signals of past land use do we see on current day biodiversity and how can we use this knowledge to, to promote restoration or to sort of fine tune restoration? So I've shown this picture a couple of times. This is a forest um, that we call Stebbins at the Arboretum. This is one of our older and, you know, more iconic forests that we've got at Holden. Here you can see these sort of widely spaced big trees. We've got this really dense carpet of spring ephemerals. We have these sort of mid-story trees that are sort of waiting in the wings to come up. And there's really just a sort of a healthy dynamic forested system. This is another forest that we have at the Arboretum. This is a very young forest, and so here's a forest that's a few decades old, and we can see that this is very different um, from that forest in terms of, you know, the structure of the trees in that forest, um, the, the nature of what's going on in the understory here, that being sort of a thicket of non-native species, sort of missing those mid-story species or mid-story trees. And, and this is important because this is a forest that we have, or forest type, that is really increasing in abundance um, in Ohio, as well as you know, a lot of the United States, particularly the Northeast. And so here looking at forested area over you know, the past few decades, and we can see that since about 1900, there's been this really exponential increase in forests in the Eastern United States. Um, and this has come about, of course, as agricultural land has been abandoned at ever increasing rates. And so that's great that we have more forests, but how are those forests different than the forests that would have originally been cut down to make the agricultural forests? How are they different than their old growth counterparts? And so, you know, we look at these forests and in some ways they're very different and in some ways they are very similar. And so you know, you could be in these two forests and you have large trees um, and, and, and you might not realize, you know, how different they are based on forest age. The Arboretum campus, so here we're looking at an aerial shot of the Arboretum campus um, and it is all, you know, we have a complicated sort of boundary uh, of forests and neighbors, but the Arboretum campus is, is largely forested. But this forest is a really interesting mosaic of different land use histories. And so we can look at that same sort of bounded arboretum area and, and we can overlay a photo, an aerial photo from 1937. And so we can look back in time and we can say, what were you in 1937? You are forested now, but what were you then? And so we have this whole series of plots that are shown in these colored circles here, the green plots, here were forested in 1937. They were older forests in 1937. The red dots were in some sort of agricultural use. You know, they were row crop agriculture, um, tilled, maybe they were an orchard. Um, and then we have spaces primarily in blue here that were very young forests at that point. So they were already released. Maybe they had been you know, harvested for timber. Maybe they were earlier agricultural use. And at this point in 1937, they were already recovering as forests. And this gives us sort of this, this gradient and this mosaic of past land use histories. And so again, this is, this is looking at one of those spaces on one of those green dots, one of our old forests. This is one of those young forests. And so this is not the one that I showed earlier with that really big thicket. And if you were in this forest, you would think, oh, this is a pretty nice forest. You know, it's got mature trees. It's got a few interesting things in the understory. You might not think about it that hard. 
But there's all these sort of what I'll call more cryptic forms of biodiversity that are in this forest. And so we wanted to see whether or not those were recovering in tandem with the trees. And so here looking at, um, on the left, soil from a young forest, um, you can see it pretty homogenous, this lighter brown color. And then on the right, from an old forest, and you can see this much more complex sort of layering, much darker organic layer on the top that we sort of lose in these young forests. And with this, sort of a difference in the soil microbial community. So we went into these forests, both young and old, and we looked at all sorts of forms of biodiversity, ranging from, um, you know, what was in that so soil microbial community to things like, what did the ant community look like? What about earthworms in their abundance? What sorts of trees did we have there? Um, what about the spring ephemerals in the understory? And so here, just really quickly, we'll look and see that in fact, this land use history has a huge effect on many of these forms of biodiversity that we might not think about as much. And so here looking in all of these graphs, the red bars, the bar on the left is the post-agricultural forest um, plot that the arboretum that were um, in agricultural use in 1937, and then green plots that were forested in 1937. And so sort of going across, starting at the top left, looking at ectomycorrhizal fungi, so these beneficial fungi in the forest, um, much more abundant, much more abundant in um, older forests. Uh, saprotrophic fungi, the decomposers, about even, but our pathogenic fungi, more abundant in our young forests. Earthworms, more abundant in our young forests. All the earthworms in our part of Ohio, the glaciated part of Ohio, are, of course, non-native. Looking at ants, um, as I said, for me, I love them because they are important dispersers of our spring ephemerals. Those guys much more abundant in our old forests. Um, spring ephemerals themselves, way more abundant in our old forests. They're almost non-existent in our young forests. Um, when we look at our trees, so, you know, both of these forests are forests because they are covered by trees, but our ectomycorrhizal associated trees, much more abundant in our um, old forests. And our, our buscular and mycorrhizal associated trees, things like maples, much more or slightly more abundant in our young forests. One of the things here that we see, I'll just draw your attention quickly to the upper left, looking at those ectomycorrhizal fungi in our bottom center, the ecto associated trees, things like hickories, um, hemlocks, oaks, those guys are both more abundant in our old forests. And so a question here is like a very chicken or the egg question. Do we have more of the mycorrhizal fungi because we have more of the tree hosts? Or do we have more of the tree hosts because the ectomycorrhizal associated fungi or the ectomycorrhizal fungi are there? And so it's hard to know in what direction that goes. But one thing is clear is that these ectomycorrhizal fungi do not recover even after decades of, of conversion back to forest. And so a question becomes, if we're thinking about reforestation, is it enough to plant the trees? Or do we also need to bring in some of those microbes that we know are not recovering? So do we sort of have to bring along these cryptic forms of biodiversity? And so I'm not gonna get into this in a huge way, but just to say, this is one of the spaces where we can sort of take these building blocks of understanding the basic ecology associated with land use history and apply that to restoration. So this is an aerial shot, um, an older aerial shot of um, Acacia Reservation uh, in Beechwood. This is a golf course at this point in time. It is owned by Cleveland Metro Parks who, is, um, who are restoring this back into a sort of more natural area. And so this is the old driving range of acacia that's being reforested. So you can see these trees are planted here, but these trees were planted in an experiment 
where some of them were planted with soil from forests, to ask that question, you know, is it enough to plant the trees in this old driving range, or do you need to bring along their um, beneficial fungal associates that we know don't recover after decades um, of reforestation? We're also replicating this sort of thing at the Arboretum. So here looking about reforestation of old fields. So these guys are standing in an old field called um, Baldwin or Upper Baldwin, and that's being reforested. And again, so we, we a couple of years ago planted about 2000 trees, about 800 of those were planted with soil from forests so that we could ask and address that question. When we're thinking about reforestation, do we have to do more than just trees? Do we have to think about those cryptic forms of biodiversity and think about some of those things like the microbial community that are not just going to, to recolonize naturally probably. And so here we're asking about forest age and its influence on biodiversity and how we can use the knowledge to promote restoration. And so, you know, what we find is that forest age drives biodiversity across a big range of taxa. Uh, and these responses may provide future restoration pathways, particularly when we're considering species that interact with one another in critical ways. And so the final thing I'm gonna talk about is, is a project that's really near and dear to my heart. Um, it's where I, my team spends a lot of our time and that is Holden's Working Woods. And so Working Woods is um, really a demonstration of forest management practices and also one of those um, living laboratories where we can sort of unpack some of the some of the um, management strategies and their impacts. And so again, this is not working woods. This is seven, one of our oldest and most beautiful forests. This is working woods. And so working woods is about six years old. It's recovering the forest there actually is about 60 years old, recovering post agriculture. So when I look at this forest, I see smaller trees, really densely spaced. Uh, most of the trees in this forest here are red maple, some sugar maple, some tulip poplar, and then the rare, you know, oak um, that might be in the system, but mostly, mostly dominated by red maple. And then in the understory, these big thickets of non-native shrubs. And so here, one of our big two for non-natives is multiflora rose and then glossy buckthorn is our other big non-native species that form these sort of dense thickets in the understory. And so our question is really, how do we get from this, this 60 year old sort of awkward teenage phase forest to this more stately old forest? Um, so more, more resembling an old growth state in, in like less than 300 years. Can we accelerate that trajectory? And we're doing that by implementing a range of sort of standard management practices that at their core sort of sort of mimic processes that we think might be an old forest. And so one of the things that we're doing in a subset of the plots in Working Woods is thinning the canopy. We're thinning the canopy trees by um, about 20% usually by girdling. And so something that we don't have in a young teenage forest that we've got in old forests are these sort of old grandma trees that die, right? So, so an older tree might die and be standing in place and that's critical habitat in the forest. We don't have that um, to the same extent in these very young forests. And so about 20% of the trees have been girdled. So they're, they're left to die standing in place. And this, ostensibly should free up resources, right? So it should um, reduce competition on neighboring canopy trees, but also free up resources in the understory and let more light into the understory free up, you know, soil resources for neighboring trees, but also for the next generation of trees, sort of promoting recruitment in the understory. The problem is if we have big thickets of non-native shrubs and we don't control them, are we just going to free up resources that will then uh, grow bigger thickets of non-native shrubs? And so a subset of our plots 
we also completely remove the non-native shrub layer. And all of this amazing work is um, going on by our conservation team. So here is a schematic, you know, thinning is one of the treatments, thinning plus removal of non-native shrubs. And then we leave some of the plots unmanaged um, so that we have a reference to compare to. What we see in terms of changes in biodiversity and productivity, we want to be sure that's due to the management and not just some natural shift through time. And so here, looking at two treatments side by side, you can see the line, the marcading in the middle, a unmanaged control on the left, on the right, uh, a plot that has been thinned in the overstory, and then that non-native thicket layer has been removed. All of this hard, heavy lifting work has been done by Holden's conservation team. And that is, in fact, influencing these very basic biotic conditions. So here, uh, as well as abiotic conditions, looking at the left on change in canopy openness, we see that in the thinning and thinning and non-native control um, treatments, we have a more open canopy. And then just as proof of concept, on the right, we can see we have reduced the percent of non-native shrub cover when we, in fact, remove non-native shrubs. And so then we're out there as a research team in that forest looking at all sorts of dynamics that are happening in there. In particular, we spend a lot of time looking at what's happening in the understory, in part because this is the next generation. We're looking for what seedlings are coming up, how likely they are to survive, um, how likely they are to be moved around. And so just really quickly, I know we're almost out of time, one of the things we do is look at crew production. So when we thin the canopy, so we've got our control plots and our canopy thinning plots, are we going to produce more fruits in the understory? The answer is yes. So this is work led by PhD student Alexa Wagner. She's just graduating now. Um, we see slightly increased fruit production in the understory. This is great in the case of spice bush, one of our native species. This is not so great in the case of glossy buckthorn. So when we thin the canopy, we do in fact see more production of fruits by glossy buckthorn. That's moving in a direction we might not want to go. How likely are these guys going to be removed? And so we look at bird mediated fruit removal. Um, and to do this, it's really hard to look actually at the removal of fruits um, because they are just gone and you don't know if a bird took them or they dropped off. So Alexa made these clay fruits. And so here you can see the little beak marks in some of them, or they're sort of ripped. This tells us that a bird um, engaged with this clay fruit. And so if it had been a fruit, it would have been dispersed. And so here again, looking at control, thinned, and thinning plus non-native shrub removal plots, we see that in this case, fruit removal is increased when we thin the canopy as compared to in the control plots, but that this change goes away when we also remove that shrubby layer in the understory, the non-native shrubby layer. So this suggests that that um, non-native shrub layer might be important habitat for some of these birds that are going to disperse the fruit. The team is also, and led by PhD student Alexa Wagner again, looking at the dynamics of seedlings on the understory. So does this relate to um, differences in recruitment of woody seedlings and, um, you know, what they're doing in the understory? And we see that, in fact, we get more recruitment um, of woody seedlings when we do both thinning of the canopy and removal of the non-native shrubs. Thinning of the canopy alone, which is the middle bar, doesn't really change versus control. And then just briefly, we see various dynamics when we look across common species in the understory. So some species really responding positively when we look at growth, some actually responding negatively to some of the treatments when we look at growth. And so really variable dynamics across species, which ultimately lead to shifts in the community composition. And so here looking at, you know, seedling communities in these meter square plots in the photos at top. Um, but then in the graph in the bottom, this is sort of as a community ecologist, how we look at variability across treatments. So we're looking at all of the plots in their composition and looking for variation and what those species compositions are. And at the end of the day, we do see 
these compositions being um, shifted by our treatments. But specifically, we see that thinning alone does less to change the community than does thinning done in tandem with non-native shrub removal. So everything that we see seems to suggest that forest management has a pretty um, has a pretty high likelihood of shifting our communities, probably in directions that we'd like to see them go, but that thinning the canopy alone isn't enough to make the change, that in fact, we do need to remove non-native shrubs in tandem with that management. And so thinking about Holden's forests and best practices in management, we see that forest management is something, is a tool we can use to reshape the next generation of our forests. Um, and that while canopy thinning is important, non-native management is gonna be a really critical piece of that. And so, you know, we're using Holden's forests as these living laboratories, and those are really allowing us to unpack how forests are going to, to sort of cope with the challenges in the coming decades, but also really what we can be doing to help make those forests as resilient as possible. And of course, it takes a village to do science. And so this is my village. And, um, you know, many thanks to all of them for making the research happen. And with that, I think we are out of time, but if we're allowed, I will take any questions. All righty. I also let put a message uh, to all of them if, since it is kind of late, you can also email me uh, questions. Um, the only one that I have currently listed is um, an interesting question because I've heard this too that um, I've started hearing things about with garlic mustard not doing less is better for garlic mustard like letting it go yeah I think I think one of the concerns is that um, when you pull it mm -hmm. that you disturb the soil which then might promote you know, more, more garlic mustard. I think some people actually clip it to avoid the pulling. Um, that is so much work that our conservation team still pulls. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's really hard to get ahead of. And it is really this fine balance of, you know, trying to disturb as little as possible, but not letting it set seed. Um, to to keep you know the cycle going. Yeah, that is probably the biggest thing because um because I'm not really sure. I mean, it was an interesting article that I read. I think it was like Cornell or University was like, mm -hmm. oh, you shouldn't do anything. But I was like, I I hate the stuff. So <laughs> we have I, we have areas that we don't manage at the arboretum, and it doesn't go away. So it, it yeah. stays there. Um, yeah, so. All right, I don't see any other questions and since we are past eight o'clock, I think we can go ahead and just call it a night. And once again, if you have a question, you can always send me an email. I will send an email tomorrow morning. So you can always reply to that and I will get in touch with Katie if I can't answer it <laughs> and we can get you an answer. Awesome, guys. Thanks for having me tonight. All right. Thank you. All right, everyone. Have a good night. Bye. Bye, guys.